Sherry Faye Smith was an outgoing and witty 17-year-old from Lexington, South Carolina. In the days before her disappearance, she had been preparing for the end-of-year graduation ceremonies and a trip to the Bahamas that would subsequently follow. The 31st of May 1985 was like any other summer day in Lexington, South Carolina. Sherry went to the bank with her mother and boyfriend Richard to get traveller's checks for the upcoming vacation to the Bahamas. On completing their task, Sherry said goodbye to her mother and left with Richard for an afternoon pool party she was attending with friends. Sherry, alongside her boyfriend, got a lift with these friends to the lake and left her car in the shopping mall parking lot. At 2.30pm, she called her mother Hilda Smith to say they had finished swimming and were about to leave for home. After picking up her car at the mall, she drove home and was seen by her father at the end of their 750 foot driveway at approximately 3 pm. Shari, like other members of the family, knew there was likely to be some post waiting at this time, so it wasn't unusual for her to stop her car, get out, and retrieve whatever post there may be. Her father quickly realised that she hadn't entered the house and looked down the driveway once again. When he did so, he noticed that the car was still there and the driver's door was ajar. Not yet panicking, he left the house, got in his own car and made the short journey down his drive. On arrival, Sherry's car was still running. He called out for her, getting more frantic as time passed by without a reply. Looking into the car, he noticed that her personal belongings were all there. Most worryingly of all, he saw his daughter's medication. Sherry had a rare form of diabetes and needed these tablets so as to stave off dehydration. Instantly, he was assured that something was gravely amiss and went straight away to the house to call law enforcement. Within the space of an hour, the Lexington County Sheriff's Department were out looking for Sherry Faye Smith. Family, friends and local residents also aided the search effort. The Smith house was in a rural area about 10 miles outside of the town of Lexington and there was woodland nearby. This area was extensively searched from air and land, but there was no sign of the young girl. Whoever it is that has our daughter Sherry, we want her back. We miss her. We love her. And please send her back home where she belongs. The next real piece of information came at 2.20am on Monday, June 3rd, when Hilda Smith answered a phone call from a man claiming to have information about her daughter. He described the clothes Sherry had been wearing, a yellow tank top and white shorts, over a two-piece black and yellow swimming suit. The man told her to expect a letter in the mail the following day. The letter, according to him, would be dated the 1st of June 1985 and would have the time that it was written, 3.10 a.m. The caller then asked that Hilda pass two pieces of information onto Sheriff James Metz. Firstly, she was told to tell him that he was searching in the wrong place, and secondly, that he wanted Metz to go on local TV at 7pm and call off the search. The authorities didn't wait around for the letter to arrive at the Smiths' residence. They woke the postmaster up, and a letter addressed to the Smiths was found at 7am. This letter was sent off to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division for analysis. A key individual in the case, Lieutenant Rita Schuler, would garner some important information which would prove key to the case. We will come back to this later. The letter had been written by Sherry, and at the top of the page, written in capital letters, was the words, and I quote, last will and testament. The letter focused on her family. She told of how much she loved them, the memories they shared, and told them that she was going to be with her, quote, father. In what was undoubtedly a harrowing time, she continuously sought to comfort her family and give them hope of a future reunion. There was also a message to her boyfriend Richard in which she asks him to accept Jesus as a saviour. During the examination of the letter and envelope, another call was made to the Smith residence. 
the authorities at this stage were recording everything. It came at 3.08pm. This time Dawn, Shari's older sister, answered the phone. She was told to pass it to, quote, Mrs. Smith, which she did. Did you receive the letter today? Ah, uh, yes, I did. Okay, so you know now that this is not a hoax call. Yes, I know that. Okay, listen, listen real carefully. I got to hurry. Uh, I know these calls are being traced. Uh, is Sherry with you? Sherry is now part of me. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our souls are one now. Your souls and are one now with Sherry? Yes, and we're trying to work this out, so please do what we ask. He also told Hilda Smith that she would receive information about her daughter in two to three days. The Smith family didn't have to wait that long for the next phone call. The following evening, the same man called again and gave details about the kidnapping. As expected, he said that Shari was at the mailbox when he approached her with a gun and forced her into his car which was parked behind hers. He also reiterated that him and Sherry had become one at 4.58am. On June 5th, yet another call came in. The caller immediately began giving directions to a location where Shari could be found. Hello? Listen carefully. Take Highway 378 West to Traffic Circle. Take Prosperity Exit. Go one and a half miles. Turn right at sign. Moose Lodge number 103. Go one quarter mile. Turn left at White Frame Building. Go to backyard. Six feet beyond, we're waiting. God chose us. Following these directions, they found the heavily decomposed body of Shari Faye Smith. The FBI would later comment that the six day wait to give information was likely intentional. Due to the hot weather, the remains would have decomposed rapidly and a good deal of evidence was likely to have been lost. This indicated that the killer was savvy and became an even more ominous threat to the surrounding community. It wasn't possible to determine the cause of death though the coroner speculated that she may have succumbed to complications arising from her diabetes or asphyxiation. Either way, she had died while being held against her will, and this would mean that whoever her kidnapper was would face first-degree murder charges should authorities find him. A day after Shari's body was discovered, the killer contacted an investigative reporter called Charlie Keyes, who worked for the local news station WYS in Columbia, South Carolina. During the conversation, he told Keyes he wanted to turn himself over, but didn't want to be killed in the process. In order to prove it was him, he gave the reporter snippets of information which only the killer would know. The caller then made it clear that he wanted to pass what he had said onto Sheriff Metz. Finally, he said Keyes could have an exclusive interview if the sheriff's personal phone number was mentioned during that night's broadcast. At this point, he hung up the phone. However, staying true to his previous behaviour, he called the Smith household that same evening. Only this time, he asked to speak with Sherry's older sister, Dawn. As he had mentioned to Keyes, he told her he was going to turn himself in, but there was other pieces of information he gave. For example, he said he would send the family a picture of Sherry, which he took while she was standing at the mailbox. He also mentioned that another letter from Shari had been written, that she was cooperative in her demise, and finally, that she had died after he had suffocated her with duct tape. After Shari's funeral service had taken place, the family returned home. Shortly thereafter, the phone rang and the same man asked to speak with Dawn once again. He told her he had lost the courage to hand himself in, while adding that he was an attendee at the funeral. He also said the following. This thing got out of hand and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I've been watching her for a couple of To who? To, I'm sorry, to Sherry. 
Dawn, I hope you and your family forgive me for this. When you killed Cherry, was she at peace? She wasn't afraid or anything? She was not. She was at peace. She knew that God was with her and she was going to become an angel. The police officers present in the cemetery were goaded for lacking the intelligence to pick him out and apprehend him. Finally, he told Dawn he would ring the family home again the following Saturday, which he did. There would then be a break in the calls for a short period. Anyone familiar with the Mindhunter book or series may remember the name John Douglas one of the first agents to popularise psychological profiling within the FBI. Hoping that he might be able to give investigators a better understanding of the man they were dealing with, they brought him in. The profile Douglas created was as follows. The man would be white and in his late twenties to early thirties. He would be single and a blue collar worker, possibly working in electrical contracting. This was postulated because the perpetrator was capable of altering his voice when making calls to the Smith residence. He was likely to live locally and was above average intelligence. He would probably have a criminal record and would likely be overweight and unattractive with low self-esteem. The phone calls were motivated by the need to feel powerful, an aspect of emotion he likely had not experienced during his life. When the calls came to a halt, police and media speculated that the killer had committed suicide. He had talked of taking this way out during some of the conversations he had with Dawn. Unfortunately, for one young girl, he didn't follow through with these warnings. Deborah May Helmick was a nine-year-old girl who lived with her parents, six-year-old sister and three-year-old brother in Shiloh Trailer Park in Richmond County. At 4pm on June 14th, 1985, both she and her brother were playing in their front yard, right below their residence's front window. One of the neighbours, Ricky Morgan, who was looking out onto the premises at the time, testified that he witnessed a silver car drive rapidly into the trailer park. The car went past the Helmick property and his own, and then pulled a U-turn. Before leaving the trailer park, the car came to a rest close to the two children. The occupant exited, walked rapidly over to Deborah, picked her up and brought her to his car while the girl was kicking and screaming. Ricky left his premises and got to within 40 feet of the car. However, Deborah was gone. Naturally, he ran into the house to notify Sherwood Helmick, Deborah's father, about what had happened. The two men hopped in a vehicle and went in the direction that the car had been seen to go in, but they were unable to locate it. The next port of call was the police. Ricky Morgan, however, was able to give some important information. The car had South Carolina license plates and the first letter was a D. He also described the man as overweight, white, between the ages of 30 and 35 approximately 5 foot 9 inches tall, he sported a short beard and had brown hair. When police arrived at the property, they instantly began to make connections. There were differences, age being the most obvious, but there were similarities too. Both Sherry and Deborah were blonde, and the modus operandi was eerily similar as both had been taken from outside their homes. The abduction areas were also in relatively close proximity. The link was definitively confirmed when the killer called the Smith household once again and offered directions as to where Deborah could be found. Okay, listen carefully. Turn right, last dirt road before you come to stop sign. Go 50 yards, and to the left. Go 10 yards. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Following the directions given, Police located the remains of Deborah in Lexington County, South Carolina. Like Sherry, Deborah had been left for a total of eight days in the summer heat and was heavily decomposed. Authorities knew it was unlikely they would obtain any information leading them to the killer. The key piece of information authorities needed came from the letter sent to the Smiths after the abduction of Sherry. 
The FBI and state forensic experts had diligently examined the letter for anything that might lead them in the direction of the man responsible. A break came when they utilised a piece of equipment known as an ESDA, electrostatic detection apparatus. The device allowed them to hone in on indentations left behind from previous scribblings, which had took place on the same notebook given to Shari when writing her last will and testament. A number of words could be made out, but the most important piece of information detected was a phone number. Some of the details garnered from the indentations led them to two pensioners. The couple were contacted by phone and they were able to identify the number. It belonged to their son, who was located in Alabama. On checking the son's alibi, they were able to rule him out as a suspect. When this was confirmed, they showed the couple the profile made by James Douglas. One name came to mind, Larry Jean Bell. The man responsible for the murder of two young girls had been found due to the work of Lieutenant Rita Schuler, and it all came down to a list of numbers that were left on a notepad for Larry by homeowner Ella Shepherd, who had sought out someone to house it while he and his wife were away on vacation. After describing the type of man they were looking for, police then played one of the phone call recordings to the Shepherd couple. As soon as they heard it, they knew without any doubt that Larry Jean Bell was the man police had been looking for. Authorities naturally searched the house, believing this to be the place that Shari was brought to after her abduction. They did find six of her blonde hairs. It also transpired that some of the calls were made from the Shepherd residence. Larry Jean Bell was born on October 30th, 1949 and was one of five children. Not a lot can be ascertained about his upbringing, but it appears as though his family moved around a lot. As James Douglas predicted, he was an electrician. He had a year-long spell in the Marines, but was discharged after accidentally discharging a bullet from his own firearm into his leg. He had been married, however, this ended in 1976 after a divorce and his only son appears to have been in the custody of his mother. Knowing they had their man, the police wanted to make sure they got him unhurt. On June 27, 1985, they sent a police car to monitor his house. That morning, he came out of his parents' home, got into his car, and drove off unaware that police were a matter of minutes away from arresting him. As he pulled out of the drive, they tailed him, radioed another patrol car, and they decided between them to box him in when the opportunity presented itself. Everything went as planned. He didn't put up a fight, and police had their man in custody. From day one, he denied having any involvement. Rather, he said the quote, bad Larry Jean Bell, unquote, did it. During his trial for the murder of Sherry Smith, he behaved erratically. Bell would mumble to himself, and during a six hour long testimony, he made bizarre comments about Mona Lisa being a man. For most, it was a simple and obvious attempt to feign a psychological ailment. The jury deliberated for 47 minutes and returned a verdict of guilty for kidnapping. He was found guilty of first degree murder with regards to Sherry Smith and sentenced to death. In 1987, he appeared in court again for the first degree murder of Deborah May Helmick. He was once again found guilty. On October 3rd, 1996, Larry Jean Bell was executed by means of the electric chair, a method of death he had chosen because he believed it would quickly send him to heaven. The death was witnessed by Sherry's uncle Rick Cartwright and Deborah's father, Donnie Helmick. Cartwright described the execution as closure and stated that the family had forgave Bell. There was no such forgiveness from Donnie Helmick. He stated a saying and I quote, I really have no feeling about this. Now, maybe I can get a rest. Kill the son of a
Once again, thanks to everyone for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do make sure to give it a like and drop a comment down below. And if you'd like to see more similar content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and keep up to date with all things Mystery Scope. As always, until the next time, do take care.